There's a lot to see in and around the engines on Battleship Texas, so our walk around will be split into three videos. This first one includes a brief introduction and a tour of the upper grate or highest level. A second video will tour the mid grate and control stand. The third will take place on the lower grate and include a peek into the shaft alley. Before we begin, let's talk about why she had reciprocating engines, even though turbines had already seen use on earlier U.S. battleships. These engines are not only the largest surviving marine reciprocating engines found anywhere, they also represent the peak of reciprocating design. Many more engines of the type were built after these, but they were smaller and did not include any significant improvements. That even includes the final ones installed on a U.S. capital ship, Battleship Oklahoma. These can be described as four-cylinder, triple-expansion, double-action vertical engines. To break that down a little, the steam goes through three levels of expansion and it requires four cylinders to do so. One for high pressure, one for intermediate pressure, and two for low pressure. The immense volume of expansion required for the low pressure stage required two cylinders to contain and use it. The engines are called double action because pistons receive steam from above to push them down, then from below to push them up. This essentially doubled the amount of power produced by the engine. It also gave each very heavy piston the ability to lift itself back to the top of its stroke rather than use the power generated by other pistons. While they worked well, their overall inefficiency and complexity rendered the two steam engines obsolete not long after being placed in service. While that seems odd, there were good reasons for their use. The decision for their use on Texas was based upon several reasons best explained in a 1913 paper by C.W. Dyson. The large direct drive Curtis and Parsons turbines that were then in use experienced excessive blade erosion, weighed as much as reciprocating engines, and took up as much space. Their need to operate at low propeller speeds also resulted in poor fuel economy at low cruising speeds. While reciprocating engines had effectively reached their practical limit in size and output, they could still provide the power needed to drive a battleship at maximum design speed. They also showed better fuel economy at low cruising speeds. Additionally, the wear and maintenance issues associated with reciprocating designs were largely eliminated by the development of forced lubrication systems like those on Texas. Having said that, the Navy knew that the days of reciprocating engines in battleships were rapidly coming to an end. The approval of reliable reduction gears and improvements in turbine blade design were already in the pipeline. They soon combined with the need for greater power output to make turbines the only choice for power, simplicity of operation, and reliability. Here is a cross-section of an engine on Texas. You can see that it's both large and is divided into three levels. Each is crowded with equipment that gives us a lot to look at. For that reason, we've divided the walk around into three separate videos. This first one will take us to the upper grate. We'll then go to the mid and lower grates in the two following videos. Here on the upper grate, we'll see where high pressure steam comes into the engine, along with the main throttle valve and other important devices. We are currently standing at the forward end of the upper grate in the starboard engine room. Uh, there are three separate levels in the engine room. The engines are quite tall and a lot is happening on each, uh, each level. In this case, what we're looking at is a, large, a lot of large piping. This is where steam comes in to the uh, engine room. Now outboard here on the outboard bulkhead, this extremely large pipe is the incoming steam main. This is where steam comes in for the engine. The first thing it hits is this tank here. This is called a separator. Now, unfortunately, there are times when there's water caught up in that steam, and that can be extremely damaging to valves and to other engine components. So this uh, separator allows any liquid water to drop out of it. Now, from this point, they've actually disconnected it here, but it reduces from a 14-inch to an 11-inch steam pipe that you can see goes through the inboard bulkhead. This is called a cross connect. This is what ties the two uh, engine rooms together. That way, if you had a, a steam problem on one side, uh, one of the steam mains, let's say on the port side, you could shut the port engine room off from that, open up this uh, cross connect, and feed both engines off of the uh, starboard uh, steam main. Now we come off of the uh, separator and you can see we have a pipe that goes forward, a steam line that goes forward. 
Actually, it's this one right here. And if you look, you can see there's kind of a geared wheel there that enters a housing. That's the main throttle valve. Now that gear attaches to a shaft that goes over to the operator system. But this is what uh, opened and closed and throttled the steam going into the high pressure cylinder of the engine. This is what was called a balanced valve. And it's called that because uh, if you have 265 pounds of pressure pushing against one side of a valve, then it might make it difficult to open. Well, let's take and apply some of that pressure to the other side of the valve, and that takes the strain, most of the strain off that valve and makes it easier to open and close. Now we can see there's a really gigantic pipe farther, farther forward. There. And then there's this one that's here. This is where the steam exits the engine. There's a forward and aft low pressure cylinders on the engine. This is where the exhaust steam comes off of them. And then they both pipe down into the main condenser, which is over here. And we'll see that in more detail a little bit later. Now there's a couple of other things to see here. First of all, we have this big silver tank here. Well, we operate steam on what's called a closed loop system. What that means is as steam is used, it exits the engine through these two large pipes. It goes into the condenser where it's converted back into water, condensed into water. It's, it's de-aerated, uh, filtered, uh, any oil or grease extracted from it. It goes into what's called a hot well, which is the main feed water tank, where it then goes back to the boilers. But before it goes back to the boilers, it goes through this tank, which is a feed water heater. This uses steam to preheat that water, and that really helps boiler efficiency. Now, one other thing to see here is this big tank. Uh, there's a vast amount of lubricating oil that's pumped throughout the engine. It falls down into the engine pit, and act, which acts as a sump. And then that oil is filtered and pumped into this tank where it sits. And the, uh, any, any particles of contamination will, will uh, hopefully sink to the bottom. Any, uh, any water that may have gotten into it floats to the top. And that way they can draw rather purified oil off of it. Here you can see sight glasses that could be used to determine how much uh, oil is in the tanks. Now we're gonna walk forward. If you, uh, whenever we do a boiler room video, you'll see this, this is very recognizable. This is called a uh, foam generator. If you had any kind of like an oil fire in here, you can't put it out with water. This used live steam, which would come through this pipe and uh, with a fire hose hooked to it, they could blow foam. Now let's get down into the meat of it which is the engine itself. So here we are standing on, still on the upper grate and we're standing about midway on the, on the inboard side of the engine. And what we're looking at here is the high pressure cylinder. High pre and this is where the steam was brought in through that steam main. Uh, by the time it got through that valve, maximum pressure was about a, a 265 PSI at a temperature of about 420 degrees. Now this is a double acting engine. That means that steam uh, had to go through a valve that admitted just the right of steam, amount of steam for the right amount of time uh, into the, above the piston to push it down. But then as the piston reached the bottom, that valve would switch over and it would push steam against the bottom of the valve to push, I'm sorry, the bottom of the piston to push it back up. While that's happening, it's a, that same valve is exhausting steam from the top of this piston. And it switches back and forth like this as the engine uh, rotates. Now that steam goes through an intermediate valve, which is right here. And actually, there's two valves here. And you, one thing that immediately identifies a valve is it's got what look like little hi-hats or cylinders on top of them. Those are called improved Lufkin assist devices, and they actually acted to help provide some lift on the valves. The valves don't produce any power directly, so their weight and the reciprocating effort is pure loss to the system. 
Well, these Lufkin assist devices use steam to take a lot of the weight off of those, those uh, uh, valve pistons and make it turn easier. In any case, the steam coming off the high pressure cylinder uh, has expanded to the point to where it can't be handled by just one valve. So they actually have two valves linked together that then take that steam and they put it into the intermediate cylinder here, which is quite a bit larger. Now those valves do the same thing to it, applying steam to the top, exhausting steam from the bottom, and then ex applying steam to the bottom, exhausting steam from the top. The uh, steam exhausting from that actually comes out and splits in two. The steam goes forward from here to the two, pi uh, two piston type valves that uh, admit steam into the forward low pressure cylinder, which is there. And then it also carries aft into the low pressure valves that then admit steam and exhaust steam from this very large low pressure cylinder. Well, now why are there two low pressure cylinders? Again, that steam coming off the intermediate cylinder expands so much you can't have a single low pressure uh, piston large enough to handle it. So they split it into two. That's actually a pretty good thing because that allows them to balance the, uh, the uh, energy being created by each piston and, and split it up to where it's a little more balanced on the crankshaft. Now let's walk a little bit further aft. And what we see here are more, uh, these are called auxiliary steam lines. These uh, all hook up and run to uh, uh, take lower pressure steam. It's generally like around 150 pounds or maybe even as low as 25 pounds. And that's what's used to run all the auxiliary pumps, compressors, and that are steam operated. So now we're gonna go ahead and go down to what we call the mid grate.